had his last opportunity to say he was and get it right, and he chickened out. <laughs> like you, uh, if you've got Bibles with you, you turn with me to a very familiar chapter, Gospel of John in chapter 3, John chapter 3. And uh, as we look at this, we're thinking in this session on hope for the self-righteous. And uh, in one sense, it's kind of interesting. We began um, with a man that we, we said was like a neighbor from hell. Uh, that was the man of the Gadarenes. We said this man, um, he, he was so fierce, nobody would go that way. And so we went from the worst neighbor you could possibly have. We're going to end with probably the finest neighbor you could ever have. This man called Nicodemus. But they both needed the same thing. And that was salvation to Christ alone. And so as we look at this, we're going to just read. We're going to do a couple of little readings. Uh, I'm going to read from chapter 2, actually, verse 25. And it really fits with what Kurt just said in his introduction. It says in verse 25 of chapter 2, And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. I find that quite a remarkable statement. But what that means is Jesus knows what's in your heart. You know, that he, he can see beyond the outward show of what you look like and how you act, but he knows the real you. It's amazing. And we're going to see this passage. We're going to talk about him loving us, even though he knows what's in us. It's quite remarkable. So he says he knew what was in man. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, it says there was a man. So Jesus knows what's in this man as well. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. But no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Maybe that will suffice for our reading. So <clears throat> we're talking about this idea of being born again. Now, it's kind of a familiar term. I remember in, in, back in England, the Volkswagen Golf. I think over here you called it the rabbit. Fancy he called it a car rabbit. I mean, what, I don't know what they were thinking. Like, that's not exactly a P, is it? I mean, Jaguar, you can understand. <laughs> rabbit, no, that just didn't, didn't make sense. But anyway, in England, it was called the Golf. And then they brought out a new updated version, and all over there were these big posters, Born Again Golf. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Like, it's, it's deep. And of course, politicians that are running for office usually will say they're born again, whether they are or aren't, because they want to get the Christian vote. So they'll say, I'm born again. So we're going to think a little bit about that topic of being born again. But I want to give you the background to this chapter, because it's really interesting. The Lord Jesus had just begun his public ministry, and he did it in a very spectacular way. He went to the temple in Jerusalem, and he drove out all the money changers, overturned the tables, and really caused quite the splash. Uh, we, my wife and I, we were in Ireland as missionaries. Now, I want you to imagine that our opening salvo, if we arrived in Ireland, we went to the local cathedral, and we started smashing all the idols and all the rest of it, and, you know, kind of driving out, you know, that would get the headlines. We'd probably be in prison, actually. But Jesus did something that dramatic. And so, as a result of that, he gets a visit from this man, uh, this man, Nicodemus, who's coming representing a significant group of religious leaders. And they want to know, who is this man that he would dare do something like this? So that's kind of the background. He, there's this kind of curiosity. Who does this thing, guy think he is coming into town and making such a splash entrance? 
And so that's what brings this man Nicodemus to it. And so notice it, it tells us about this man, he's a man of the Pharisees. Now, again, I want to just say that um, the Pharisees were the strictest religious group in Israel at that time. In fact, you know, the Jews all believed in tithing, giving a tenth. But these guys, they were so strict that they would even go into their herb garden and they'd count the herbs to make sure God got everything. Like that's zealous, isn't it? They, these are pretty uh, zealous individuals. And so you could say that this man outwardly, uh, this man of the Pharisees, might look very impressive. Very religious, very devoted. And not only that, it says he was a ruler of the Jews. So he was part of the, the ruling council, what we call the Sanhedrin. Uh, you know, kind of, a, he was a, a, we would say this, he's a well-educated, well-respected, moral, dedicated, religious man. Probably a finer specimen of humanity you'd ever want to meet. You'd be glad to have him as your neighbor. I mean, he's a community man, a pillar in the community, a kind of a nice guy. Humanly speaking, that's what he seems to be. And yet the Lord knows what's in man. Sees to all the sham. He knows exactly what's going on in this man's heart. And so it says he came to Jesus by night. Now again, maybe, <laughs> for different reasons, maybe I didn't want to be publicly associated with Jesus in the daytime. Maybe it was because of the crowds. It was hard to get near the Lord Jesus. So maybe a nighttime appointment might be better. Maybe it was because if he was seen too close to Jesus, he might get cancelled, you know, by the cancel culture crowd <laughs> hanging out with Jesus, this radical guy who just cleansed the temple. Whatever the reason is, he actually pictures what unsaved lost people are. They're in the dark. They're in the dark. If you, if you don't know Christ tonight, Scripture says you're walking in darkness. It, it talks about your evil heart being darkened. You might look good on the outside, but inside you're as dark as night. And that's what this man was. He's a dark person spiritually. And yet he comes respectfully to the Lord Jesus, and uh, it tells us that, that he calls him uh, a, a rabbi, a teacher. Now, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. So he acknowledges Jesus is a great teacher. And he even talks about the miracles Jesus did. He said, nobody could ever do these miracles like you do unless God was with him. So, so clearly, I mean, full of compliments. So how does the Lord Jesus respond to this respectful man who's full of compliments? I like to say he goes for the jugular. I mean, he goes right to it. He says, verily, verily. We talked about that last time. Veritas, veritas. Truth, truth. This is verifiable truth. And so what he says to this man is this. The truth is, the truth is... And I'm saying it to you, that's what makes it truth, because Jesus always spoke the truth. He says, I say the truth. He says, except a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He says, Nicodemus, you, you might impress everybody around town, but I want to tell you, you won't even get a look in when it comes to the kingdom of God, unless you're born again. Not only will you not get into it, you won't even see it, right? Unless you're born again, you won't even get a, get a look in. And so I often think about this. I think if Nicodemus, this nice guy, couldn't get a look in to God's kingdom unless he's born again, well, there's no hope for a rascal like me. Because I'm not like Nicodemus. And neither are you. And so the idea is this. If this man can't get into the kingdom of God, neither can you, unless. I'm glad it says unless. It means that there is a way you can get in, but it requires something special. It's called the, the new birth, being born again, being, being made new again. Kind of a complete radical transformation is needed so that you are fit to get into this kingdom. And without that, 
you'll never see it. Now, Nicodemus says, and it's a great question, because he's, tending, he's thinking in the natural realm, not the spiritual realm. And so he says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time in his mother's womb and be born? I think there's a reason he's saying this. I, I think the idea of a new start and a new beginning is appealing to everybody. Because all of us have regrets. And sometimes the thought of starting over is kind of appealing. But he says, I can see a bit of a problem here. I'm a bit big to get back into my mother's womb to come out again and start over. Because he's talking about being born again. You see, so he's thinking, naturally, well, how do I, how do, I do that? And you see, the problem is, even if he could get back into his mother's womb and come out again, unless he had a fundamental change of nature, guess what? He'd make the same mistakes all over again. Because you know, and I know, that babies, it's not long before they start to exert their self-will. Don't we know that? I mean, they're lovely and cute and cuddly for a little while, but then when they begin to get a little bit older, they begin to assert themselves, don't they? What's some of the first words that come out of their mouth? <clears throat> no. no. Or my. That's right. right? And this selfish, willful nature is clearly seen. And that's true of every baby. I know yours is the most cute, cuddliest baby that ever was, but it's a sinner. I know, we don't like to say that. But stick around. You'll see exactly what I'm saying. Every one of them. It, we, we had five children. We never had to teach them how to do wrong. They were naturals. Absolute naturals. I mean, we had to work really hard to get them to do right. And so, what we can say is this. That this idea of a new beginning and a new start is a wonderful idea. And by the way, it's, it's an idea that we can offer you today. But it's not through going back into your mother's room. We've got a better solution to that. But it is, it, isn't it good that we can say to you that today... You can have a new start on life. A complete new beginning. God's a God of new beginnings. And we can, no matter how bad the past has been, how wicked we've been, how many wrong things we've done, we can get that new start and start all over again with a whole new life of a different quality than we ever imagined before. That's a hopeful message, isn't it? And that's the message we're bringing. And so the Lord answers him. He says... Interesting verse, verily, verily, I say to you, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Immediately people say, well, does that mean you've got to be baptized? If he's born of water and of the Spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. So a lot of people say, well, you know, when you were baptized as a baby, you became, well, I was told when I was baptized, I don't remember it, but I was baptized when I was just a few days old, and they told me that I had become born again. Huh. And it didn't seem to work much. But that's what I was told. Because people think this idea of being born of water is when you dunk a baby in water. Or sprinkle it with water or whatever. Here's the interesting thing. I want to suggest to you that that's not what it's talking about at all. See, Jesus hasn't even given the command to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At this point, he does that at the end of his ministry, not at the beginning of his ministry. So it's clearly got nothing to do with baptism. Sometimes the Bible uses uh, water as the picture of the Word of God. And that's a good explanation. Certainly, nobody ever comes to Christ without God using the Word of God in the process. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. But I don't even think that's what it's spoken speaking about. I think he's speaking about you need two birthdays, a natural one and a spiritual one. The first birth, you're born of water, right? The was it amniotic sac verse and the waters break. You ever heard that? Waters broke, baby's coming. Born of water speaks of natural birth. Born of the spirit speaks of a second supernatural birth. You say, how do you how do you ensure that that's right? Well, verse 6 convinces me it's right. Notice what it says. That which is born of the flesh. 
What does that refer to? Natural birth. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Spiritual birth. And so what he's simply saying is this. You need to have two birthdays. First birthday is the day you were born. Second birthday is the day that you were born again as a new creature in Christ. So I can tell you, I have two birthdays. 15th of July, 1960 was when I was born of water. 16th of June, 1981 was when I was born of the Spirit. Two birthdays. We often sing, when it's somebody's birthday, we say, was it two will... We hope you have two. We hope you have two. Right, that's We're right. We're glad you have two. We're glad you have two. Yeah, so we want people to have two birthdays. And that's what he's saying. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> I knew the song, but I just couldn't get it in my head. So he says <laughs> in verse 7, Marvel not, or don't be surprised, that I'm saying to you, you must be born again. Now, when you say something is a must, what do we mean by something's a must? It's like you don't have an alternative, right? This is essential. This is this is absolutely critical. This is uh, this is a must. You you must be born again. And and again, we say this that uh, we, we would love to see every one of you in this room again in the kingdom of God. That's why we're doing this. We want to see you in the kingdom of God. But there's something that must happen to you. If you're ever going to be there, that is, you must experience this spiritual birth that he's speaking about. And so, um, in verse 8, he talks about the wind blowing where it wills. You hear the sound, you can't tell where it comes from, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So he's talking about the mysterious working of the Spirit of God on a person's life to bring them to this birth, this spiritual birth. And that's the, what's so wonderful about things like this weekend, is that we can't see what's going on. But we do know the Spirit of God is working. And it could be that somebody right where they're sitting believe the gospel and are transformed right in their seat. And they have a new birth. It's like the wind. You can't see the wind. All you can see is what the wind does. Right? It causes trees. I remember one time we were living in Florida, and uh, it was the first time we'd ever heard of tornadoes happening. There were 50 tornadoes going through the state as a result of a hurricane. And so foolish English people as we were, instead of being in the bathtub, we were looking out of the window because we've never seen anything like this. So we're all excited. We're watching, and we're watching trees, palm trees, kiss the ground. Well, we could see the wind was doing something that night, right? We couldn't see the wind, but we could see what it was doing. And we amazingly can see sometimes the Holy Spirit taking somebody who's so upright and proud and causing them to bow down and trust Christ as their Savior. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so he, he says, the wind blows where it goes. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? And I think it's a great question. I think it's a question you should be asking. If you're not already asking, you should be asking this question. Okay, you're saying I've got to be born again. You're saying it's a must. You're saying that there's no way I'll ever see the kingdom of God unless I have this new birth. Now, please tell me how. How can these things, if I, if I can't go back in my mother's womb, that's not going to work. But tell me how, how does it work? And the Lord says something very remarkable. He says, um, he, he says, uh, are you a teacher in Israel? You don't know these things? He's kind of a, amazed that this man, who's a teacher in the nation of Israel, and he can't even tell people the most fundamental question of all, how we get to heaven. You know, the tragedy is Springfield, Missouri is full of churches. Almost on every street corner there's a church. But I would suspect that a lot of them can't even tell you the most basic, fundamental thing, and that is how to get to heaven. I grew up in a church. I was there for 20, no, 18 years before I totally rebelled and left. And I never once heard how I could be born again. I never even heard John 3.16 until I was 20 years of age. 
Not once. That was in the church. And so I, I suppose I should have gone back. I did actually go back and talk to the parish priest. He was actually more than that. He was a Monsignor. And I shared some scriptures with him. But you know what I should have said to him? Are you a teacher in England? You don't even know these things? That's what I should have said. <laughs> I'd say it's 2020. But you don't even know these things. The tragedy is he didn't. And so, um, what is kind of almost like rebuking him? You don't even know these things. And then again, verse 11 he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak what we do know and testify what we have seen, and you receive not our witness. So he's talking about we. Now, up to now, it's only Jesus speaking, but he says, we know what we're talking about. So who's the we? Well, he just mentioned somebody else. He talked about the wind blows like it wills. Thus is everyone who's born of the Spirit. So what he's saying is, God the Son, God the Spirit, we know what we're talking about. Because nobody knows the way to heaven better than the one who came down from heaven. Right? If anybody knows how to get to heaven, it's the person who came from there. Like, I can tell you how to get, get to my house, because I came from there, and I can even tell you how to get in. Not gonna, but I could. <laughs> tell you the code. Because that's where I came from. And so here is somebody who came from heaven, and he says, I can tell you exactly how to get in. Isn't that wonderful? To have the person that came from there Tell us, I know exactly how. It's, it's really easy. This is how you get in. And so he says, if I told you of earthly things you believe, not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And then he says, no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. In other words, the reason he says this is, the only person who can legitimately tell you the way into heaven is the one that came from there. Nobody else has ascended to heaven. Nobody else has made it there on their own efforts, no matter how self-righteous. The only one who knows the way is the one who came down. And so this is the one who's speaking. So he's going to tell the way. Now, this is if you want to be born again, you need to pay attention to this. He's going to tell you the way. And what's interesting is from verse 14 onwards, we're going to read a word that's going to be repeated over and over again. And this little word is the key that unlocks the door that lets people experience the new birth and enter into heaven. That word that's repeated over and over again is believe. I'm going to say it over and over again. Believe, 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 believe. This is what you've got to do. So let's just look at what is it you have to believe. There's something you have to believe in order to be able to be born again and in order to be able to get into this heaven that he's speaking about. And so he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now remember, Nicodemus is a Pharisee. Pharisees have memorized huge chunks of scripture because they are zealous. So they, they, and especially the first five books of Moses, they would know them well. So when he says, as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, he would say immediately, oh yeah, Numbers 21, verse 5. Now, he wouldn't do that because they didn't, they didn't have them numbered at that time. But he would know exactly where in the scroll it was. So we might not know that. So I'm going to just tell you the story. But I'm going to ask you to turn there. It's a really interesting story. So the people were in the wilderness, and they were constantly bellyaching and complaining about God's provision, his leadership, the food that he provided. They're, they're just complaining constantly. Did we ever do that? That's kind of the American way, isn't it? <laughs> we like to complain. And so they're belly aching, and so God sends a judgment on a complaining people. And there are snakes that start biting them in the wilderness. People are dying. These snakes are really having a heyday. And so, they, they, they apologize for complaining. They kind of repent and they say, pray to God for us that he might do something to save us. And so, God tells Moses to make a serpent of brass 
and put it on a pole and lift it up before the people. And all the people had to do, if they were bitten by the serpent to be saved, is look to the uplifted serpent on the pole. If they looked, they would live. What do you got to do? That's simple, isn't it? Just look and live. But there'd be some of them that say, well, that's too easy. Yeah. What you're telling me is too easy. I, I'm not going to bother doing it. What would happen to them? They died. Or they're saying, well, no, no, what, what we need is, is some anti-venom, you know, kind of material or something like that. You know, that's the way it normally works. You know, we, this look and live idea is too simple, too, too silly. No, it's not good enough. But what happens to them? They die. But there were some simple souls who just simply looked at the uplifted servant. When they looked, they lived. It's a simple message, isn't it? Look and live. And so what he says here is, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted. But just as that serpent was hoisted up and people who had been bitten by the serpent, all they had to do is look and live, even so, he says, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is going to be lifted up. That term is always used at the cross. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he was hoisted up on that cross, hanging there for all to see. And the message is very simple. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You want to be born again? You've got to look, live. Back in Isaiah 45, verse 22, it says this, and again, it's a, it's a messianic prophecy. And it says this, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. Not just those in the wilderness, anywhere. Look unto me. And you see, that's the message we're giving this weekend, is that not look unto me, but look unto Jesus Christ hanging on that cross. Why was he there? Why was it a serpent, by the way, on the pole and not a lamb? You ever wondered that? See, usually the Bible pictures Jesus as the Lamb of God, and yet here he is, and it's a serpent on the pole. Why, why did he not stick a lamb on the pole? Well, the answer is simple. When Jesus was on the cross, he was made to be sin for us. And so the idea is that he bore our sin, as we said in the previous session, on in his body on that tree. And God caused him to be the sin bearer for rebellious sinners. And if they would look at him and say, God, you, you bore my sin, I can be free. Look and live. It's a wonderful message. Look and live. And then he goes on, he says, and this is, this is an amazing verse, verse 16. For God so loved the world. You know, that's how I got saved. John 3, 16. It dawned on me, if God so loved the world... I was part of the world. So it must mean he loves me. And I thought, how could he ever love someone? Because I wasn't like Nicodemus. I wasn't a self-righteous person. It's a rotten sinner. Yet he says he loved the world. By implication, he loved my capital. And then he says... He loved this world so much that he gave his only begotten son. That's amazing, isn't it? See, I'm, I'm an only child and an only son. And I, I, my parents didn't want to give me up for anything. They didn't even like it when I got married because they were losing their little boy. That's <laughs> amazing. They didn't like it. Amazing, isn't it, really? And yet God willingly gave up his only begotten son. Then he says there, that whosoever, don't you just love that? So it, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, as Kurt said, whether you have gray hair or like him, <laughs> his own particular style, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter. Whosoever, you can put your name in there. In fact, you could do that. You could say, God so loved your name, that if I, your name, would believe on him, 
I would have this amazing promise that I would not perish, but I would have everlasting life. Isn't that amazing? You can put your name in there. Because I want to tell you something. God loves you. Christ died for you. He wants you in the kingdom. He doesn't want you to miss it. He wants you to come into it, to enjoy it, to experience. He wants his house filled. But you have to come his way. He's giving you the key that lets you in to this new life, this new birth, this entrance to the kingdom of God. He's giving you the keys. It's believing in Jesus Christ dying on the cross to pay the penalty of your sin so that he can be your savior. So that you can believe him and believe that he rose again on the third day and that he alone can give you that new life. And it is a marvelous life. And so it says God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. See, he doesn't, he doesn't want you to go to hell. That, the hell was made for the devil and his angels. It wasn't made for human beings. But if you listen to the devil's lies and believe them and think you can get there without Jesus Christ, which is his biggest lie of all, then you'll share the fate of the deceiver. That's the way it is. So he says he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He wants you to be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believes not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So this is where you know, the rubber meets the road. What will you do with Christ? If you want to even get a sight of the kingdom of God, never mind enter into it, you must be born again. Now I want to tell you something. <laughs> the, the Bible is very wonderful the way it works out. And so what it, what it says is this. If you're born twice... You only die once. So you're born physically, and then you're born again. You will only ever die once. You may not even die once, because the Lord is coming, and he's going to snatch his saints away. And some will go to heaven without dying. So, so you may not even die once, but at the most, you're only going to die once. But you know the tragedy is, if you're born once, you will die twice. Because when it says at the end of the Bible that those that had not believed in Jesus Christ, it says they were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. It means to be spiritually separated from God for all eternity. No hope of reprieve, no chance of escape. You will be there forever and ever and ever. And one of the worst things about hell is that even if you die with Alzheimer's, you will be given a perfect memory. Because there's a story of a man, a rich man in hell, and the Lord Jesus said to him, Son, remember. And the strategy is that you'll remember, you'll even remember this message. Isn't that amazing? That in hell you remember that you could have had the key that let you into the kingdom of God. If you'd have believed in Jesus, dying on that center cross to pay the penalty for your sin. Could have been in heaven. And oh, when it talks about the worm dying not, I think what that is speaking about is this: that it's going to eat away at you for all eternity. That you didn't have to be there. You could have been in paradise with Christ. And that's why we urge you, with all the conviction we can muster, you must be born again. Don't leave this place 
without knowing for sure that you've been born again. Because I suspect that there will become a time that you will wish you'd never be born at all if you're not born again. I want to urge you, please, look and live. Look to the uplifted Savior of the world who died and took the penalty that should have been yours and believe on him, trust in him, say, Lord, I want you to be my Savior. And he'll save you right in your seat. And you'll experience the new birth. And the new birth is such a miraculous birth. You see, some of you are probably thinking, well, I couldn't live that Christian life. The Lord's got that covered. If you just come to me, We'll work out all the details. Don't worry about that. He, he gives you a new life, a new makes you a new creature, changes your desires, changes your whole person. You'll be brand new. And you'll have that new start, that new beginning that you so really yearn for. If you're really honest. You made a lot of mistakes. Wouldn't it be good to get a new beginning? We're offering you a new beginning today. Please, come to Christ. We're ready to talk to you. We do have literature. Uh, we do have time. We're not in a rush. I know it's Sunday afternoon, and that's nap time for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But I'd stay up all day and all night if I could persuade you to accept Christ as your Savior. So please, don't turn away from this opportunity. Let's pray. Father, we just pray, you know what's in man. And you know the people in this room. And you know those that are born again. And you know those that are not. Those that are lost. Those that will never, unless they're born again, see the kingdom of God. And they may be able to fool us, but they'll never fool you. And we pray for them, Lord. We pray if there's one here that's never trusted Christ as Savior. To realize the seriousness of being bitten by the serpent of sin and the fact that they're about to perish and they would look in faith to the uplifted Savior who bore their sin on Calvary's cross and believe on him. And they'll look and they'll live. We'll give you the praise and glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Amen.